Our New Testament reading for today is uh, Philemon 1, 1 through 22. A um, little background, this is a letter from Paul who happens to be in jail, and it is about uh, his friend that was once a slave called Onesimus. And he has written a letter to his friend Philemon asking him to forgive Onesimus and accept him back into his presence. What you may not know is that during this time of, of history, if you were a slave, you weren't any more than just property. You could be bought, sold, traded, and discarded. In fact, if you were old as a slave, you could be very easily dismissed from the household to live on the streets with no repercussions whatsoever. And if you were a slave and you escaped, you could be put to death. Well, Onesimus was going back to Philemon, and Paul felt very uh, much akin to Onesimus and felt that he needed to implore Philemon not to kill him, but to bring him back into his home. And so if you listen to this letter that he wrote, that um, Paul's kind of buttering him up a little bit. He builds him up, makes him feel good about himself, and then then he gets to the point and says, well, because of my position in the church, I could tell you what to do, but I'm imploring you to do what's right in love. And I think that's what God is saying to us to do today, is do what's right in love. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith May it be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement, but because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Jesus Christ, that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who has become my son while I'm in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you. But as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this in my own hand, and I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of, of your obedience, I write you knowing that you will do even more than I have asked. And one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. The reading of God's Word for the people of God. Also, our...
scripture reading this morning. How many of you brought your Bibles with you? Amen. Thank you for bringing your Bibles. Open them up to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 14. I'll be uh, beginning at verse 25, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It may be a little different from some of your translations. Luke 14, verse 25. Great crowds were following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my follower, you must love me more than you love your own father and mother, wife and children, Brothers and sisters, yes, more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And you cannot be my disciple if you do not carry your own cross and follow me. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first getting estimates and then checking to see if there's enough money to pay the bills? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of funds. And then how everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and ran out of money before it was finished. Or what king would ever dream of going to war without first sitting down with his counselors and discussing whether his army of 10,000 is strong enough to defeat the 20,000 soldiers who are marching against him? If he is not able, then while the enemy is still far away, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace. So no one can become my disciple without giving up everything for me. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I was preparing this sermon, I got thinking about my time that I spent with the confirmants. And the time that I spent with them, uh, we discussed Wesley's quadrilateral. And I'm sure that uh, I could call any of them down here and they could tell you all about Wesley's quadrilateral. Isn't that right, Gabriel? I think he's the only one that's here this morning that I see. No, Anna, she's here somewhere. Uh, but anyway, just to give you a little uh, refresher about Wesley's quadrilateral. Wesley's quadrilateral has to do with our doctrine, what we believe and why we believe the things that we believe. The first part of Wesley's quadrilateral is Scripture. Scripture, scripture is primary to everything that we believe as Christians and as followers of Jesus Christ. Scripture has to be first and foremost in everything. The second is tradition. Tradition is very important in the church. Why, just this morning you recited the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed was written in 325 A.D. People were still looking for Jesus to return. It had been nearly 300 years and He hadn't returned yet. And people started having different ideas about Christianity. Some people began to say, well, you know, that Jesus fellow, he really wasn't human. He was God. And so since he was not human, then he really didn't suffer like we think he suffered. And so all kind of different ideas and false teachings began to arise. And so they sat down, all the bishops got together in the known world. They went to Nicaea and they sat down and, and they wrote this thing. It took them a long time to come up with the Nicene Creed. And so in the church, we recite this Nicene Creed because it tells us what we as, as Christians believe. We sing songs. We sing hymns. Part of the tradition. We partake of communion. More tradition in the church. And we read Scripture, which is tradition. The third part of Wesley's quadrilateral is personal experience. If I ask each and every one of you to tell me how did you come to know Jesus Christ? When did you first experience Jesus' love? You could tell me your stories. Every one of you could tell me a different story about your own personal experience in, with Jesus Christ. And the fourth 
is reason. Reason. We use reason to determine why we believe in Jesus Christ. We don't believe in Jesus just because mom and daddy told us to. Or the preacher said it was so. Or our spouse tells us that that's what we need to do. We use reason to understand and to understand what Christian life is about and why we do all these other things. Reason is taking Scripture and being able to prove it in other areas of our lives. Reason is why we do the traditional things that we do in church. And reason is what I wanted my compromands to understand. And so I took the book of Philemon and I began to explain to them about reason and the reason that Paul used when he was writing this letter. Now Philemon is a very unique letter. It's the only letter that Paul wrote that was addressed to an individual. The only one that was written to, to a person rather than to a church or congregation. And Paul wrote this letter. It's also one of the shortest. Who read Philemon for me this morning? Okay, thank you, Carl. I know that you had a difficult time. There was a lot of strange names in that little short book. Some of them are difficult to... Uh, uh, to pronounce. Uh, some of the other people called it, uh, Phil instead of Philemon, they called it Philemon. So that's what a lot of people grew up, but it's actually Philemon. I took New Testament studies at Duke under a guy named Dr. Mickey Eford. Some of you know Dr. Eford, have read some of his books or maybe even listened to him lecture. He is a one of the patriarchs in the, in the uh, Duke School of Theology. He's been there for over 50-some years. And I consider myself privileged to sit and listen to him teach. And he was teaching this, this book, Philemon. And he asked one of his students to read the, the entire book, which is, what, 25 or 27 verses. And so the, the student began to read. And when he got down to the name of the runaway slave, he said, he called him one Simus. And Dr. Eford heard that, and the guy just kept right on reading. And he, and he stopped him. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, what did you call him? He said, one Simus. He said, no, no, no. He said, he said, at Duke, we use the correct pronunciation. And he said, you need to understand that, that his name is Onesmith. He just took his glasses off, and he looked at Dr. Eford, and he said, well, Dr. Eford, he said, he might be Onesmith to you, but he's one Simus to me. So regardless of how you pronounce Philemon, Philemon, Onesmith, or one Simus, it really doesn't matter. What we do want to understand is the purpose that Paul used in writing this letter. You see, Onesmith was a runaway slave. And he ran away from Philemon. Philemon was a very respected, highly a uh, very wealthy individual. He was a leader of the church that Paul had actually started. They're not sure whether it was Colossae or maybe Laodicea is where the church started, that Philemon was the leader of this church. And he had it, they had the meeting in his home. And Paul actually led Philemon into the belief of Jesus Christ, into becoming a believer. And so Paul is here in jail in Rome, and he meets this runaway slave while he's in prison. And they become friends, and they begin to share with each other. And, and Paul leads this runaway slave to Jesus Christ, and he becomes a brother in Christ. And as, as they begin to share with one another, Onesimus shares with him that he's a runaway slave. And Paul is grieved over this. He says, you know, I have to send you back. I don't want to, but I cannot be a part of this crime because I, I cannot be a, an accomplice. And you see, at that time, in the known world, there was 600 million slaves. 600 million slaves in the world. It's what one professor, one scholar uh, is quoted as saying. So with that many slaves in the world, 
they had to be careful and not give the slaves too much leeway. They had to keep them in line because they were afraid with that many slaves, if they gave them too much leniency, they might create a revolt, maybe even a, a civil war. So when a slave got out of hand, they were very strict, very cruel to make an example of the slave to the other slaves so that they would not repeat the offense. And for someone to steal and run away like Onesimus had done, he could have easily been hanged or beaten to death. And so Paul realized the danger that it was to send him back to Philemon. But he also realized, too, that he did not want to lose a brother in Christ. So he, he wrote this letter. And this letter is a letter that is brilliant as you read it and understand what Paul is saying. In the first part of the letter, he wants to build Philemon up and tell him what a wonderful person he is. I think of you often and I pray for you. He continues on. And then as he builds him up and tells him that he's so thankful that he's doing all these things and that he's, he's a leader in his church and he's, he's appreciative of all that he does. And then he goes on to say, and I want you to do me a favor. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to accept this runaway slave, not as a runaway slave, but as a brother in Christ. I don't really want to send him back to you, but I feel like I have to because it's the right thing to do. It's almost like cutting off my right arm. He's so useful to me. And he says, and oh, by the way, I don't need to remind you that I saved your life too. Kind of holding something over his head. And then he says, to show Onesimus all these graces. Give him forgiveness. Be a real disciple. Step up. He said, oh, and by the way, get a room ready for me. I'll be coming by in a few months. I'm going to be checking up on you, Buster. So I want you to do what I've asked you to do. And so we find out later through other writers that indeed Philemon did indeed forgive Onesimus. Paul even went on to tell Philemon, he said, well, if he owes you anything, I'll pay for it. Don't worry about any, anything he may have stolen or taken from you. Put it on my account. I'll take care of it. See, we find out later there's an individual, his name is Ignatius. Ignatius lived in the 3rd century A.D. Ignatius was a bishop who had been marked for martyrdom. And he was on his way to Rome to be, to be killed. And as he was on his way, he had made different stops at different churches along the way. And one of the places that he stopped was in Ephesus. And he wrote a letter to the church and praised their bishop who had been there years before. The bishop's name, Onesimuth. Onesimuth. So we know that Philemon had done the right thing. And through him doing the right thing and stepping up and, and, and showing Onesimuth forgiveness, that Onesimuth went on to become one of the great bishops in the early church. So isn't it amazing what God can do when we will step outside the box? See, I'm sure Philemon felt that he was cornered. He felt pressure because all of his peers who had slaves felt like, you can't be easy on this guy. What kind of message will that send to the rest of the slaves? What's it gonna, what, what is the message to the other slaves that he owned? Many times people, they condemn Paul for not condemning slavery altogether during that time. But you have to understand it was a time period where slavery was accepted. It was part of the culture. But he did have a relationship with Onesimuth and he wanted Philemon to forgive him and he did. And that brings us back to the reason. You see, Paul was able to use reason to get Philemon to step outside the box, to be the disciple that he wanted him to be, that Christ wanted him to be. So many times the world expects us to do what the world does. 
The world expects us to conform to the way they do things. But Paul wanted Philemon to step outside that box, to be brave enough to do something different and to spare the life of Onesimus and show him, you know, forgiveness. And that's what he done. And then we, we look at Jesus, and Jesus is talking to this crowd that's following him. And he's telling people, said, in some of your Bibles, some of your translations, it may say that Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to hate your mom and daddy. You've got to hate your brothers and sisters. You've got to hate everybody else and love me. That sounds pretty cruel, doesn't it? That sounds a little bit unreasonable for Jesus to say that because Jesus teaches us to even love our enemies, not to hate our mom and daddy. What Jesus is doing here, he's using a thing that's called hyperbole. Hyperbole is an exaggeration of things. For instance, you're in the hospital, you're in pain, and the nurse says, well, tell me your pain level from 1 to 10. And you say it's 100, you know. Well, that's an exaggeration. You know, you're, you're really in a lot of pain. And Jesus used the same thing. He used hyperbole in other areas. He said, you can't see the speck in your brother's eye because you've got a log in your own eye. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He didn't really mean for us to cut off our hands and our feet. And he didn't really mean for us to hate our mom and daddy. He was trying to draw an illustration so that, he would, uh, that we would understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That we have to put Jesus first above everything. And that can be difficult. That can be a hard thing to do. And so that's what he's trying to make us understand. We've got to count the cost before we act. I think about this thing over in Syria. It's a serious situation. We have to count the cost. And I'm glad that we've got people who are not quick to jump the gun, who are looking at and considering the cost. What is the repercussions of this if we do get involved? What other country is going to get involved? How much war can we afford? How many lives, how many more lives? Will it cost? Yes, it's a terrible thing what this madman over in Syria has done to kill the women and children and, and, that, and other individuals that he has killed. I see the pictures on TV and it makes me sick on my stomach to see all these poor children suffering the way they are. And it makes me want to lash out against him too. But we have to count the cost. You know, counting the cost is something that involves everything in our lives. For years, I flew airplanes as a 135 operator, and, and I'd get a phone call and be asked to fly from point A to point B. And so one of the first things you would do is you would go in and you would do your flight planning. And I can remember in the, on the wall in the flight planning room, there was this huge map of the whole United States. And there was a string that was attached to Charlotte, and you could take the string and you could stretch it out to wherever you're going. And then you hold that place on the string and bring it back over here and show it on the mileage chart. And it would tell you how many miles it is from Charlotte to wherever you're going. And then after you know how far it is that you're going, then you determine whether you'll have enough fuel on board to make that trip. And if it's too far away, then you have to find you somewhere in between to make a fuel stop. And along that flight planning, after you determine your, your mileage and your weight and your fuel, then you determine what the weather's going to be. What am I going to need along this, along this trip? What kind of weather am I going to encounter? Well, I need those little approach plates that I gave you a couple weeks ago to make an approach into an airport. Will the tower be in operation at 2 in the morning or will it be closed? Will I be on my own to make this approach? Or will I have some help from ATC? Do they have any runways that are closed or any construction going on? You do all this type of planning before you ever even get to the aircraft. 
And so many times I see on TV, and oh, by the way, I got Susie trained. Anytime there's an airplane crash, she says, Rick, there's an airplane on TV. So I come watch it. Because I'm interested to find out what has happened when there's been a, a plane crash. And so many times I can look at the situation, if they give me enough information, I can make a, a pretty good determination myself as to what caused the crash. Many times, it's just poor flight planning on the pilot's error. Many times, that's what it amounts to. And that's what Jesus is telling us now. If we want to succeed as disciples of Christ, we have to count the cost. We have to be willing to pay the price. We have to be willing to pay that price. This past week, Susie and I, we went down to Myrtle Beach for a few days and we took her mom and dad with us. And while we were down there, her dad just sits in, he's 89 years old, and he sits and watches TV all day and all night. He can change the channel while he's asleep. But we were sitting there and we were watching all these daytime TV shows. And we were watching Let's Make a Deal, Deal or No Deal, The Price is Right, and all these things. And I guess because of being exposed to the game shows, I come up with a sermon title, The Price is Right. But you know, when Jesus calls us to be His disciple, it doesn't matter what the cost is. The price is always right. So whatever He calls you to do, be willing to step outside of that box. Be willing to go beyond what the world expects you to do. Much like Philemon done much like Paul done, using his brain to expand and bring forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let us go forth from here knowing that we are God, that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ, that we have counted the cost and we are prepared to do what it takes to follow Christ whatever it might be. The price is always right. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, we give you thanks. Lord, we thank you for men like Paul, men like Philemon and Onesmith, men who followed you, men who counted the cost, who became disciples, men who were strong and brave. Lord, we pray this morning that as we approach you that your spirit will empower us. Lord, as we look at the cost of discipleship, we will accept it. We know that there is no price too high to pay to be one of your children. Oh, Lord, let us hear your voice. Lord, may we know when your spirit taps us on the shoulder and calls us into service wherever it might lead us, whatever it is that you're calling upon us to do, wherever you want us to go, may we be willing to pay that price. May we truly be one of your disciples that we might go forth and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Trust and Obey, hymn number 467. Please let us stand if you're able and let us sing together, hymn number 467.
We are so delighted to have visitors with us today. We're certainly glad that you have chosen to come and be with us during this time of worship. We hope that you will come again soon and share with us. But let us go forth from this place knowing that we are God's disciples, that we are followers of Christ, and that we will indeed trust and obey. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.